webinar this evening uh, and welcome to this uh, session of ACM India education webinar, which is jointly organized by ACM India Council and uh, the I6 CSE chapter, which is uh, the Indian counterpart of the special interest group on computer science education. I am Chitra Babu, chair of ACM I6 CSE chapter, and I will be your host for today's session. Before we start, a few things about the webinar as usual. The audience is in silent mode at all times. At any point of time, you can log your question using the Q&A window. We will take questions at the end of the talk. We will try to address- and We as can take questions during the talk too. I'm happy to interrupt me anytime, it's fine. Sure, yeah. Sriram. Yeah, Sriram would be uh, happy to uh, take questions even in the middle. So feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box and I'll be able to communicate that to him. And Thank we'll you. try to address as many questions as possible, but we will be limited by the time of 60 minutes allotted to this webinar. Since this is an ACM initiative, it's only fair that we spend a few minutes to understand what ACM is all about. You can see ACM India at a glance on this slide, but let me give some examples of what being a member of ACM means. You will be part of world's largest computing society. Out of the 1 lakh members worldwide, about 10% of them are from India and half of them are students. ACM India is spread across the country mainly due to its chapters. We have 20 professional chapters and roughly 200 student chapters across the country. As a chapter, you get access to ACM's Distinguished Speaker Program and Eminent Speaker Program, ACM India's Eminent Speaker Program. You can invite any expert from these programs and ACM takes care of the travel. DSP and ESP are currently available in virtual platforms too. We also have Best Student Chapter Award, which is a recognition of the activities done by the chapter, and it also carries a cash prize. ACM India has been organizing summer and winter schools for students in different research areas in computer science. Faculty for these schools are drawn from prominent academic institutes and industry. The special interest groups Six in India, or they organize national level conferences and symposiums like COD's COMAD, which got concluded just uh, in the beginning of this month, and uh, innovations in software engineering uh, conference ISEC uh, that is going to be in the in February, and uh, uh, ISEC CSE organizes the Compute Symposium annually. Compute uh, concluded uh, last November, and again it will be uh, it will be organized uh, in the coming November. So I, uh, we had organized a teaching video contest as part of that uh, uh, compute symposium. Since a lot of faculty members are attending this uh, uh, webinar, so I uh, uh, request all of you to look at the compute website to know more about uh, the activities of uh, I6 CSE and also participate in large numbers in the uh, teaching video uh, challenge. We have something special for promoting gender diversity too. ACMW, which works for empowering women in computing. It has many initiatives for female students. We organize Lady Ada programming competition and hackathon specifically meant for female students. We also have one of the summer schools exclusively meant for female students. ACM India has instituted three prestigious awards, Early Career Researcher Award, presented to individuals in their early career who have made outstanding contributions to computing while primarily working in India. The award in this category for the current year has been given to Dr. Pratik Jain of Google AI Bangalore. The second one is Outstanding Contributions to Computing Education Award. The award in this category for the current year has been conferred to Dr. C. Jawahar of IIIT Hyderabad. The third award is for Outstanding Contributions in Computing by a Woman. This has been given this year to Dr. Gargi B. Das Gupta, Director of IBM Research Labs India. And uh, uh, this year, uh, uh, seven, uh, seven of our professionals have been chosen as uh, uh, distinguished ACM distinguished scientists. Uh, and uh, two, of, two, two uh, faculty members have been chosen as ACM fellows. So we are very uh, glad to share that information. Now it is my privilege to introduce our today's speaker, Sri Ram Krishnamurti, who will be giving a talk on data-centric computing, a challenge and an opportunity for CS education. 
Sriram is currently serving as professor of computer science at Brown University, Rhode, Rhode Island, US. He received his PhD from Rice University. His research interests are in programming languages, software engineering, security, network, and human factors. He is very passionate about programming languages and their design. He has authored widely used textbooks, how to design programs, an introduction to programming and computing, and another book titled Programming Languages, Application and Interpretation. He is a leading contributor. Uh, he's uh, that's a, fine. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, so, it just goes on. Don't worry about uh, it. Let's, yeah, let's that's get Just a second. I'll just finish, finish in two minutes. He's a leading contributor to the Bootstrap Curriculum, a project to integrate computer science education into grades 6 to 12. He has been doing computing out, outreach programs for more than 20 years. He's the recipient of Sig, uh, Plant's Robin Milner Young Researcher Award, SIGSOFT's Influential Educator Award, Sig Plant's Software Award, and Brown University's Riston Fellowship. And in his own words, he is terrified of success because he may be forced to buy a suit. He is known to interrogate his audience to ensure they are paying attention. So be alert. You can read your email later. This is uh, according to his own words. Uh, uh, now over to you, Sriram, for today's webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming on a Saturday evening. It's uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I'm coming to you from some distance away from the opposite corner of the world almost. Uh, uh, Brown is in Providence, Rhode Island, which is somewhere between Boston and New York. Uh, but, you know, my heart is actually uh, somewhere slightly different. Uh, there's a very quick quiz for all of you. If anyone can recognize where this place is and type it into chat, let me know. I'd love to see if anyone can guess where this is. Somebody can, obviously. So I'm going to wait till somebody does just to make sure um, I can see the chat. I think I can see the chat. So I'm waiting for somebody to type in and tell me where this photograph is from. Any guesses? Oh, is my screen you not being shared? shared? Oh, you I haven't, haven't shared, shared my screen. screen well, yet. of course. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's the problem. So let me uh, turn on screen sharing. Sorry. Uh, share screen. Thank you. So, okay, good. Good thing we debugged that. Um, Okay, I am sharing the screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so now I can no longer see the chat window. So I think I will no longer be able to do that. So I will not try doing that. Um, anyway, so I'm here, I'm in Providence, which is uh, between Boston and New York uh, in the US Northeast, uh, which is kind of the opposite of the weather most of you are experiencing. I have a lovely snowy day over here. Uh, but what I was trying to say is that uh, this is where I'm from. Uh, this is uh, Lalbagh in Bangalore, my favorite spot on earth. And uh, you know, I grew up two blocks from Lalbagh and this is kind of home for me as well. So, okay. So it's wonderful to be talking to all of you. Uh, one someday I wish I could do it in person, but here we are. Okay. So what I want to do is start by going, uh, doing a quick recap of what we typically think of CS1 at the college level. Okay. So, um, can somebody confirm that you're seeing the uh, slide that says what's in collegiate CS1? Uh, yes, Sriram. Yes, Wonderful, yes, thank you. I think we have everything working now. Okay, so what is typically in this course, right? I think we all know, we can all recognize the kinds of things that we talk about, you know, numbers and strings and variables, assignments, loops, conditionals, functions, arrays. Um, and this, this is familiar to every one of us. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how we've made progress in this course since the 1970s, roughly. Okay, uh, when, when the course first sort of coalesced and we got some sort of agreement about what goes in here. Um, let's see, you know, in the 70s, we, you know, uh, so we used to use languages like Pascal and we used to teach things like arrays. Uh, we made progress. Uh, we started to use languages like C, uh, we're still taught maybe arrays. Uh, we got to C++, uh, we still taught arrays. Um, oh, Java came along and oh, we upgraded from arrays to array lists. Uh, and finally we've made progress beyond all of this, right? We got into Python and we're back to associative arrays. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm obviously making fun of what's going on here. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that if you go back to these old, if you go back and look at these curricula, um, anybody who took computer science in the 70s or 80s or early 90s will find that not a whole lot has changed in the way many of these curricula are taught. Obviously, some of you are doing very innovative things, but not everybody is. And uh, you know, there's sort of, we've reached a sort of fixed point too early in the evolution of computer science. 
right? So we have this nice blob CS1 that seems to take up a lot of uh, the sort of the mind space about how we think about uh, computing. Um, but there's actually a lot of pressure now being applied on CS1 from lots of different angles. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what those pressures are, right? So on the one hand, we have kind of sort of pressure from above, right? We have this, uh, what one could call the unreasonable effectiveness of data to borrow a phrase, right? So uh, huge amounts of data have changed the, the way we do computer science. And I'm actually making a very strong claim here, right? Data-driven algorithms are a fundamentally different kind of algorithm than traditional computer science teaches, right? Traditionally, if you wanted to make something better, you had to change the code. With data-driven algorithms, you can leave the code completely unchanged, just change the data, and the algorithm behaves in a qualitatively and quantitatively different way. Right? That is a new mode of thinking in computer science that we haven't really internalized in our curricula in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the broad sweep. Obviously, many of you here are gonna be exceptions. There's also pressure from below, right? So there's this whole bunch of like low code and no code kinds of systems, uh, sorry for the typo, uh, systems that basically are changing what it means to be, what the amount of effort we need to build certain kinds of applications. Things that we spend weeks and months teaching our students to write, you can literally do in five to 10 minutes using you know, drag and drop or not even drag and drop, just clicking on buttons and getting working systems that are better than anything we could have written by hand. Right? So there's another kind of pressure from below, which we may not be thinking about, which is there are a whole bunch of synthesis tools now. And there are things like you know, uh, GitHub Copilot that basically do code synthesis from text. You write text and it spits out code. Sometimes the code is right, sometimes the code is wrong. But in many cases, uh, for simple programs, it actually does a better job than humans would, or at least does it quicker. And that's a new development that also changes what we might think about uh, needs to be taught to students and the way it needs to be taught, right? So you can already see some tension, just like in math education, there's this longstanding tension about like, should we or should we not teach with calculators? These kinds of systems are bringing that same tension into computer science education. But then there's many more things that are happening. There's demand from other disciplines, there are student diversity concerns, there's all sorts of concerns about societal impacts. And so all these things are sort of beating up on CS1 from all these different angles with the result that like our nice agreement that we may have within the discipline actually does not match what we, what we need from the outside. Okay. Now, set against this, there's a major new curricular trend in many places, which is popularly called data science. And it manifests in all sorts of ways. We have courses, we have boot camps, there are even degree programs, master's programs, undergrad programs, and so on, that are, again, almost like the creation of a new discipline. Now, there's a lot we could say about this. Um, in fact, uh, there was a very nice uh, talk at uh, the, same, uh, 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 the, the same seminar series, uh, I think about two, three months ago from uh, Jan Harris which basically talked about some of the concerns as well. So the fact remains that this is a big deal and it's changing the way we think about computing education. And in particular, this field requires us to think not just about programming, but also about statistics and visualization and so on. So this is like a whole new thing that is happening, whether we like it or not, right? Nobody is asking for our permission to do this. People are doing it anyway. So the question is, how should we view this? Well, I generally hear sort of two main kinds of things. There are people who are very upset at this, at the nature of computer science that's being taught. People get upset. They're like, they don't even teach the basics. It's just all these tools and libraries and so on. Okay, it's a valid criticism. Uh, there are people who feel threatened by this. It's a threat to our degree programs. You know, they're stealing our students. May also be true. Um, but I like to take a third perspective on this, which is my perspective is that these programs are actually a criticism of the current state of computer science education, and in many cases, a valid criticism of it, okay? So what are some of the valid criticisms that I see? Uh, one is that in many cases, curricula are not very current, curricula are not very engaging to students, right? Now, of course, when I say this, everyone's gonna get upset because they're gonna say, well, my curriculum is, and I have no doubt that yours is, the thing is, in the aggregate, somehow they still are not, okay? Um, Curricula do not connect quickly to societal problems, real world phenomena, and so on. Um, you often can't do very much after one course. If all you can do is program over arrays of numbers, there's not a whole lot meaningful that you can do that you couldn't have done faster even before taking the course, just using like you know Excel, for instance. Right? And finally, 
Computing is now being used everywhere and students aren't prepared for it. It's sort of a combination of the above three factors, okay? All right, so what I wanna talk about now is how we might think about reforming computer science education in particular early computer science education for the era of data, okay? So I could give you a very sort of high level philosophical talk. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna give you a sort of very, I'm gonna start at a very detailed level. And I'm gonna start by getting back to the slide that I, that I showed you before, right? And I sort of made a slightly mocking slide and you'll see why I brought this up earlier. Um, and what I'm gonna do is start with this as my critique, okay? So I will pause for a moment and see if anybody has any issues with the slide presentation or with any questions or anything like that. I'm looking at chat for the moment right now. Um, if I don't see anything in chat, uh, but uh, maybe Chitra, uh, if you could just type. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, slide, all uh, good? the slides are visible and your voice is pretty clear. Uh, as of thank now, you. there are no questions. Wonderful. Bimlesh, thank you also for the confirmation. Sounds like everything's good. I don't see any questions, so I'll keep going. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start, go back to the slide and start with my critique by saying, at the simplest level, we could have just started with a different data structure, okay? And I'm going to make a strong case that the right default data structure for us is really the table, okay? And this might not sound like a big deal, but I think it actually quite radically changes the way we think about teaching computing. So first of all, at the most basic level, right? It's a data structure that has a very rich structure. It comes basically already parsed for us, right? Unlike natural language, which is also real world datum, it's already parsed for the most part. And um, even children are familiar with it. You can open a middle school or even a you know, sort of secondary school, sometimes even a primary school textbook, like a math book, and kids just use tables. There's not, no big deal to it, right? Um, there's a, a, a wonderful paper that I, it's not a well-known paper, but I really like, which uh, says modeling as a core component of structuring data. And this paper basically shows, uh, it's an analysis of students basically constructing tables for themselves. These are from, so, you know, sort of middle school and high school students. And I think one of these may be from a college level student, but they look at students across a broad spectrum of ages and students very naturally think in terms of tables. And even uh, if you look at the picture at the top right, there's actually a little bit of a group by going on. And that's a very intuitive concept, okay? And, and the paper also has this beautiful illustration, which is at one of the oldest known tables is actually from, you know, the, the lost city of Ur, right? So this dates back thousands of years and it's in quiniform. Even back then, people were building tables, right? So there's something very natural and intuitive about the table as a data structure. It, and next part of it is we have lots of real world tables, <clears throat> right? You, almost every government that puts out data puts out tables companies put out tables, you can build a table with like a spreadsheet, you can construct, you know, if I, I, we often do this, right? You can go to Google Forms, you construct a form, people fill in answers, you click a button, you get a spreadsheet, that's now a table, right? So tables are everywhere, they're ubiquitous, people always hand out CSV files. There are even sites like, you know, uh, Google has a project called Data Commons, that's actually trying to aggregate all of these and make them sort of searchable and useful, right? So you can get all kinds of data, so connecting data to the real world is now almost automatic, right? So I've given you sort of a fake table up top, but there's almost no reason to work with fake tables. You could start working with very real tables. Why does that matter? Well, we've done a few studies in a few different spaces. Uh, um, as uh, my introduction, talk introduction said, I work a lot in middle school and high school curricula. And uh, especially at younger ages, and also when you consider students who do not automatically identify with computer science, right? They're not already, like computer science students, people who wanna be computer scientists, they will put up with anything, right? You tell them this array of numbers is corresponds to ages and everything in there is like, you know, one, two, three, they'll be like, fine, I can pretend with that. But people who don't view the world the same way need that motivation. And one of our recent studies was about uh, data, our own data science curriculum. Uh, there's a broader part of the study, which is how, how to assess such curricula. But in our curriculum study, uh, in our curricula, students get to choose a data set. And part of the study shows that it actually is very, very meaningful to students, right? They choose it because it's something they know about or they don't know much about it. They find it, it's personally effective. Um, in the US, for example, as you know, there's lots of uh, 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 strong social movements like Black Lives Matter and so on. And so students are very connected with some of the things 
things that are happening in, in the world. And these data sets now let them talk about the same phenomena in their course, rather than there's me as a human being, and there's me as a computer scientist, and the computer scientist is completely disconnected from the human being. That's not a happy feeling for many people, right? Especially as computer science diversifies, these are the kinds of things we should think about. So cables let students connect their human selves to their educational selves. Uh, Next. Sriram, Sorry, please go ahead. Yes, yes, there is a comment from Viraj Kumar. Uh, uh, at least uh, for yes. now, a number of companies in India use ability to process elements of an array as the first cut in the hiring process. This may yeah. change in future, but for now, it's a significant factor in shaping CS1. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, is there the rest of the question or? Yeah, no, it's a comment. Okay, good. Thank you, Viraj. It's uh, good, good to announce your presence. I'm delighted you're here. Thank you for coming. Um, that, you know, uh, why don't we have that conversation at the end? I think that's a very good point. Uh, let, me, let me go through a little bit more and we'll see more about that, okay? And uh, let's see how that goes. So Viraj, hold on to that question and ask it again at the end if you think we haven't addressed it enough, okay? All right, so next benefit of tables is uh, we get to ask questions like, you know, like this, right? How many tickets are sold with the student discount? And what this does is that it, um, uh, obsession with application to ideas has led to data science separate undergrad. Yes, and uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little more. I hadn't planned to say very much, but I was curious whether that phenomenon is happening in India. And I would like to talk about that phenomenon more as well, okay? Um, again, I'm gonna go through this a little bit more and you'll see me connect back to that later in the talk. Uh, in fact, specifically to this near the end of the talk. Okay, so what these kinds of questions let us do is, I mean, this is a sort of maybe a somewhat more boring version of the question, but we get to start more, ask more interesting questions with concrete things. These are easy to envision, easy to manipulate. You can even give students tables on paper and give them a scissors and have them print it out and think about how the computation is arranged rather than having to do everything in the abstract in their head, right? This also lends itself to all kinds of interesting questions of problem decomposition, problem planning, which are the higher level skills that students need to be developing. Okay, uh, so 10 years ago, for example, I assume every, almost everyone here reads Mark Lisdial's blog. 10 years ago, he had this posting where he said a challenge to computing education research, let's make measurable progress. Right? And in 30 years, we haven't really made progress. Let's make measurable progress. And he presented, for example, this rainfall problem. So I don't have the time to give you the full context, but he said, I think we should be able to beat it. And he said, you know, this teach scheme approach focus on design based on data. I bet their students could beat it. Uh, I'm one of the creators of this curriculum. And in fact, in 2013, Kathy Fisler wrote a very influential paper that showed, yeah, our students handily beat it without even a design explicitly for this goal. Right, So Mark was making this radical claim, why don't we design towards this goal? You don't even need to if you have the right kind of curriculum. And since then, Kathy and I and our students have done much, much, much more work about understanding these issues of problem decomposition and planning. Right, And these kinds of problems lend themselves very nicely to these questions. Next point, uh, and this is going to go a little bit to Viraj's point we can do a variety of programming forms over tables, right? We can teach them through functions, we can teach them through methods, we can teach them through loops, right? So if you think about the question that I asked a moment ago, that was really a sum question, right? It was summing an array, it was just summing a column of a table. And we can even start to teach them things like query syntax. So you can teach them something like SQL. In my case, I'm interested in language embedded query. So uh, I've been building a language called Pirate. And in Pirate, this is literally the code that I would write, right? So I would say filter civ is how we say filter. We filter the tickets table using the discount column. We take the things that are discount equal student. And what we get out of that is a list or an array if you want, okay? And now we can say we extract sum all of those and those are the things that we're gonna sum. Right? Now, how you write that sum function, you can write that in about half a dozen different ways. So Viraj, there is the answer to your question, right? If you, you, can, eat, you can give them sum early on as a thing that they can use to get work done and do something interesting. After they have done interesting things, you can then say, well, now I need to teach you how it is written and we can teach you how to write that sum function, right? It's just a matter of moving it to the end rather than the beginning. You start at the beginning with a rich computational context so you can actually do meaningful things. And then you show how the computational context is built. And so you still get to the same endpoint just through a very different route, okay? Um, next point, 
So if you look at the column that I'm summing, it's the tickets column. And you might notice that it's actually not a good column to sum because it's not, the data are not properly normalized. So very quickly or late, depending on the curriculum we are designing, we get to talk about issues like data quality, normalization, cleansing, and so on, and what happens if we don't have those features. So in our curricula, we always start with students being given cleansed data sets, like neatly cleaned and normalized, so that they can focus just on the programming before we get to these issues. Some people think of the world differently, like, you know, I've had conversations with some of the R people, for example, who say, no, no, look, all of the world's data sets are corrupt in some way, therefore you have to start with this early. I don't quite agree. We can have a discussion about that later. The point is each individual instructor can decide where in the curriculum they want to bring it up. Do they even want to bring it up in CS1? Maybe this is outside the scope of CS1, right? But the point is we can have that conversation now. Right? And we can give them data sets that don't have this problem and we can do meaningful computation and these kinds of data issues won't come up or we can choose to. Next, um, you might notice that I have this uh, data format, this sort of very Western style format of first name, last name, uh, which of course, uh, you know, for those of us who are Indians is kind of a stupid concept for many of us. I don't have a last name, which always shocks my students to find out um, in a lot conventional American sense of like a family name, right? I have my father's given name. Krishnamurti is my father's given name, just like Sriram is my given name. So in India, I'm K. Sriram. In the US, I'm apparently Sriram Krishnamurti, right? So we start to talk about some of these societal issues very quickly. Um, one of, there's this wonderful article called Falsehood Programmers Believe About Names. There's now actually a whole series of these falsehood programmers believe about uh, addresses, about you know, time, about this and that. And this, I, this is one of the readings in my introductory course. And this is one of the most influential things my students read. Partly because uh, you know, I have several students who don't have a Western style name. They're either international students or domestic, but they, they come from a family that doesn't have a Western style name. And so they immediately feel themselves represented. They're like, yes, this is part of the thing I'm, I've been trying to tell people, but there are even more issues that I didn't realize. For my students who do come from a more Western culture, they're like, wow, I never even thought about these issues. It's a deeply influential article for them. And we get to have a very rich conversation about the interplay between the computational aspects and the societal aspects, right? And this is a very good starting point for this kind of conversation. Um, and by the way, the names I have here, two of the names here are actual real names. Guy Lewis Steele Jr. is a well-known computer scientist. And how does his name even fit into this format? Robbie is actually the name, he's an Indonesian. Many Indonesians have one name. He's an Indonesian, he has only one name. So where, do, where does he even get a last name from? So right off the bat, we talk about all these real world issues, which normally in CS1 we cover up, but we don't actually have to cover up quite so much. We can talk about data modeling and so on in a very rich setting right off the bat. Um, Finally, uh, we can have these higher level conversations like what is getting collected about you? Like I have a birthday column over here. What gets inferred from that? And then what are the decisions that are made? So how does modern AI work? And what are the problems with modern AI? Instead of just talking about these in the abstract, you can construct an assignment where you give them a data set that leads them to bad conclusions. I do an, I've sometimes done an assignment where I teach them about p-hacking. Right? Uh, we, we take a table, we take some, lots of columns, we compute a whole bunch of correlations. I ask them to explain one of these, you know, they, they find something, a, a strong correlation. I ask them to explain the correlation. And then I give them the other half of the data set and it turns out that correlation no longer exists. And well, what happened to their explanation, right? So we can illustrate these points very quickly and very easily. Uh, of course, it depends on what a curriculum's ob learning objectives are. Do you do that in CS1, CS2, whatever? But one of, for me, and it's an important thing for students to understand, you shouldn't just compute, you know, pair, set of all pairs of correlations, issues like that, right? So these are all things we can start to do very quickly and easily in meaningful real world ways. The last thing I want to point out about tables is they're also good for illustrating the limitations of tables, right? So here, for example, I have a family tree encoded as a table. And when you get to things like trees and graphs, it becomes very awkward to use tables for these purposes. So this now becomes the motivation for going into the rest of computer science, right? All of the stuff we normally teach in terms of data structuring like trees and lists and graphs and DAGs and so on, this is the point of departure for all of those points. So uh, this is an approach that we call a data-centric introduction to computing. This is the cover of our book. Um, and uh, we actually don't start in tables, which is what the impression you might have gotten until now. Uh, we actually start with images. 
So we get students to write uh, programs with images. It's a lot of fun, uh, but it also helps them understand this principle that the structure of the code can follow the structure of the intended result, right? So we start to teach some program structuring ideas, but also, you know, students get to create flags. They get to create like, you know, logos for their favorite team. Um, yeah, sorry, right now, uh, India's not doing so well in South Africa but maybe you know hopefully you can find a different favorite team that's doing better than that um but you can create these logos and you know flags and so on so and and again it's a matter of self-expression so in the u.s for example immigrant students love to create flags of their home countries right uh, or they like to create flags of uh, you know the designs of their teams or like a hypothetical team and so there's this sense of expression early on but it's not just like for fun it's actually teaching them a deep computational principle before they get to the rest of the curriculum right so the idea in our book and in our approach is we start with images, which is basically telling students that information and code have a structure. We get to tables and you know, we start to do like meaningful computations. Then we say, look, sometimes we have to talk about parts of the table. That's what leads us to lists. So the columns, sometimes we have to take attributes within, the, within a, a particular datum and that gets us to data types and structures. Then from there, we say, look, some of these data points may have relationships with each other that gets us to trees and graphs. And then we say, look, sometimes you need to update these values that gets us to state. And in this particular approach, we also end with hash tables saying like, sometimes you wanna improve the efficiency, right? But the key thing is every one of these steps is motivated by something a student might want to do with the data set. And lots of these things lets us talk, let us talk about like socially responsible computing ideas, you know, how does computing relate to society, the good and the bad. Um, there's planning and composition come very early in the curriculum. We get to talk about notional machines. You can introduce big O, all of these things we can do very, very effectively with this kind of curriculum. Last point I wanna make is, uh, you know, we, we have curricula, we all have ideas about what works and what doesn't. And it turns out many of these things don't work as well as we'd like. So for me and for Kathy and the rest of our team, it's really important that it be a research driven curriculum. So we've written numerous papers analyzing lots of different aspects of the curriculum. So it's sort of constantly improving with this feedback loop of like teaching, using it, doing research on it, and then going back and like adapting the material. So there's a book that's available. It's at this URL, which I'll put up again at the end. Uh, if you just want to understand our high level thinking, and this goes back a little bit to Dr. Mahadevan's question, uh, we talk about uh, this interplay between uh, data science and computer science and how this has started to create a fork at many institutions. Um, at Brown, in fact, uh, it has not created a fork and partly because we're doing exactly this approach. Uh, we have a course that's being used at Brown and several universities are starting to use it and all the materials are free and online, okay? So I wanna end with a few more quick comments. This again, uh, the first comment is gonna go back to Dr. Madhavan's question. Uh, Madhavan, sorry, not Madhavan, Madhavan's question. Um, so there's this sort of three different things, right? There's computer science, data science, and this thing that we often forget, which is called data engineering, right? So data science seems to appeal to students across campus for the reasons I talked about earlier. Data engineering is frequently overlooked, but it is actually a full profession in its own right, right? And in fact, many people who think they're doing data science are actually doing data engineering. Many people who think they're doing computer science these days are actually doing data engineering, right? Um, but many CS courses are not sitting in that space right now, right? And the thing that's interesting about data engineering is it actually needs a large amount of real computer science for doing all the management, the servers, the clusters, the cleansing, and so on. You need a fair bit of CS, right? That's why there's an intersection there. Um, and CS also needs to update itself. It needs to have things like data and statistics and so on in it at some point in the curriculum. And we're not really doing a very great job of incorporating that in some curricula. Also, computer science has, why is it so popular? Because it has a huge influence on the world. But where are we talking about that? There's more and more calls for social responsibility to be part of computer science. And many people do it in a very awkward way. They're doing it because they're told they must do it as opposed to finding an organic way of doing it, which is what we get in this curriculum, okay? So our goal in this curriculum is really to sit at the intersection of all of these places. We're doing computer science, a small amount of data science, but you can turn that knob as much as you want. And we're starting to introduce students to data engineering as well. Okay? 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, we can do all of this at the primary and secondary school level as well. Uh, we have been porting these ideas down. Uh, Bootstrap is the name of our curriculum. And uh, all, again, all these materials are available for free for people who want it. It's bootstrapworld.org. Uh, but that was not really the purpose of this talk. So I didn't really talk about that. There's some very interesting about how this sort of thing plays out at that age. Okay. So just to remind you what we did today, I started off by talking about what I think is the state of CS1 at a lot of places. Um, talked about the rise and maybe if you want to call it the threat of data science. Um, and then talked about what it might mean to redesign CS1 without losing any of the things that we value and find important, but around this new world that we live in, not just as a response to a threat, but viewing it also as an opportunity. And our work is all at dcicworld.org and uh, you're welcome to go try it out and talk to us about it. That's the end of my talk. I wanted to have lots of time for Q&A and I have given us lots of time for Q&A. So please hit me with your questions and we can start again with uh, Viraj, if you'd like, uh, Dr. Madhavan can respond, et cetera. Love to, that's it, that's the talk. Questions, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sriram, uh, for the talk. I, I think thank it you. was a little bit uh, uh, provocative also. <laughs> uh, I hope so, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that is already, there are so many things in the fray. Now you have thrown uh, data science also into that, uh, uh, mix of things. Uh, we always, that is, if there are uh, four uh, faculty members, there will be five or six opinions which uh, should be taught in the introductory computer programming course. Uh, of course. Now you notice they, the thing I did not do is I did not say anything about programming languages and so on. That's not a debate. I'm in, I mean, we can have that debate, but that was not my goal here, right? Yeah, I want us yeah. to talk about the high level concepts instead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree. Uh, now, yeah. some anonymous attendee uh, has asked, uh, as a student of CS1, what should we do to make ourselves familiar with data science? Yeah, I mean, it's a little hard to, I mean, I, I would say, I guess, uh, uh, take data science courses, right? And uh, I, I know some of the professors on this call may not appreciate my saying this, but if you can't get one at your institution, you can go online and find them, right? You can go to Coursera, for example, and find a data science course. Uh, you can find some quite nice courses taught by people who know what they're talking about. It would be ideal if our institutions would offer it because uh, taking online courses is actually quite difficult. It's, a, it's not, not a good, not an easy thing for students, but if your institution doesn't have one, there's no shortage of data science courses online that you can find for free. Um, you don't need to take it for a certificate and pay money for the certificate. You can still, if you wanna learn the ideas, you can take the, you can learn the material for yourself, right? Um, you can start with our book if you'd like to, it's all free and online and you can run the whole thing for yourself uh, without paying us a penny. So, um, so, you know, like for me, especially the, the free curriculum is a very important personal thing, you know, and I grew up in India, I couldn't afford any of these things. So it's very important for me that I put out all of my materials for free, um, sort of for the younger version of me. So you can start with our materials. You can go take a data science course on something like Coursera. Uh, I think these are all good options for you to look at. Okay. Uh, again, another uh, question from Dr. Madhavan. Should we make data uh, science as a PG level course? Yeah, uh, you know, it's hard to answer that question, right? Like, so I think, I think, here's the thing. We have to acknowledge that computer science has fundamentally changed in its nature, right? Um, as I said, the idea of a data-driven algorithm, the idea of an algorithm that improves automatically is a very, I mean, it's not a brand new idea, of course, but until recently, we didn't have the machinery, we didn't have the data, we didn't have the things we needed to make that happen, right? Um, you know, Peter Norvik, for example, has this lovely uh, essay where he uh, writes a spell checker. And in a spell checker, what he does is he basically says, here, we're going to write this basic spell checker. And then as we improve, this, imp improve the size of the corpus, the dictionary that you work with, the spell checker starts to get better, right? So like, what is, the, what is that? That's, that's this amazing idea, right? And it's A, important for students to understand that, that more and more our improvements are coming from more data, not from somebody sitting there and like, you know, cranking away at like hard algorithms. That's happening, of course, too. But a majority of things can happen without all of us having to be geniuses at algorithms. So that, and, and also if that's the nature in which a CS is evolving, how early or late should we do this? Well, I think as early as possible, right? 
we would have to do this as quickly as we can to get the idea into the minds of students. And then how soon do they go into the details? Well, that's a question I think for each institution to decide and each individual department to decide based on the resources and so on, right? Now, of course, I'm very mindful of uh, the thing that uh, Birat said, right? Like you also have to prepare students to get job interviews, but the question is, when are they going for the interview? Can they go for the interview after a semester and a half rather than right at the beginning? Well, if that's the case, then you bought yourself some time, right? So how much time can you buy yourself? But I think thinking of data science as uh, just like a sort of more advanced topic, I think is not, a, not, 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 not consistent with modern computer science. Now, what I'm doing in this, this, in this book, for example, and in this talk is a very baby version of data science, right? I'm just sort of dipping their beaks in it and getting them to understand the idea and getting them excited about it. I'm not actually teaching them like hardcore data science, right? Um, you know, at, at Brown, for example, some students will go off into a data science specialization after this where they can get more data science. Some of them are just gonna go into conventional computer science in maybe one and a half years before they take another data science class. In fact, we don't even require them to take a data science class, right? So I think that sort of customization you can do depending on the institution and nature of students and so on. But I think we should think of it as a relatively early topic, getting a basic idea early, not late. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Sriram. Uh, uh, Wullas is asking a question. Uh, he has an observation. Typically, we find young students have an aversion for math for a variety of reasons. Don't you ah, think yes, this data-centric yeah. approach to CS would yeah. end up making those students think, uh, oh, this is just math in disguise? As That's a, result a great question. Yeah. Great question, right. Uh, the subconscious bias, aversion, et cetera. Um, actually, I would say we are seeing the opposite. Um, here's, here's my experience. So, uh, about 15, 16 years ago, I started a course at Brown called An Introduction to Computing for Humanities and Social Science Students, right? So this was specifically a targeting students who were, you know, this was 15 years ago, like CS had not exploded. Uh, Facebook didn't exist. Uh, Twitter didn't exist. Uh, but I was starting to see social media like MySpace, and I said, you know, I bet sociology as a subject is going to change because of the existence of all this data. And how do we prepare our students for it? But those students are exactly the kind of people you're talking about, Olas, like deeply math phobic. They wouldn't even approach the computer science department because they've heard there's some math there, right? What I learned is if you go to those students and say, you know, they wanna know what is the prerequisite for me to take the course? And if you say there is no prerequisite, they don't trust you. They think you are lying because they're like, well, I know there's math and this person is lying to me to disguise that there's math, therefore I'm not gonna take the class. After a few years of experimenting with this, I learned that the thing that works best is to say, can you sum a column of numbers in a spreadsheet? And they say, yeah, I can like, sum a column of numbers in a spreadsheet, I can do that. Well, if you can't do that, you shouldn't take the class, right? And like, it turns out that is a prerequisite that does not rule out anybody at all, okay? But those who can, which is everybody says, oh, I can do that. So if you say there's no prereq, they, they don't trust you. But if you give them a concrete prereq, they're like, oh, I can do that. And students, we, you know, we were flooded with students for many, you know, this course has gone for many years. And that kind of approach is what has also influenced this class. This class at Brown, we actually have four different introductory courses in the computer science department. This class by far gets the most number of students who are not thinking of them as computer science, themselves as computer scientists because they are turned off by the traditional CS1, which they, they has a reputation of being like lots of hours of work and like, you know, sort of banging away at computers day and night and with relatively little to no connection with reality, right? One of them is sort of traditional list processing. Another one is like, you know, building video, you know, GUIs in Java, which in 1980 may have been very exciting. It's like, oh, wow, I can build a GUI. I can build pixels on a screen. But if you grow up with pixels on a screen your whole life, that doesn't seem so exciting anymore. It does not feel like you're actually connecting to the world. In contrast, the fact that students can work with data sets and connect to data sets and connect their lives to the comp computation makes it much, much, much more meaningful. Now, there's a question of how much math you actually use. We are very careful in the first course in our design, and if you look in the book also, to use only the simplest of discrete statistics, okay? No complicated statistics over here. So we use simple discrete statistics. Basically, we're just trying to get students to understand that they can perform some computation, they can get a meaningful enough answer that they can interpret it and then connect it back to the world. 
That's all the amount of computation you need. And for that, like basic high school knowledge coming out of high school, and you have to understand, American high schools teach far less math than Indian high schools do, way, way less math, right? We don't do any continuous statistics. We don't have to talk about probability distributions. There's no calculus. That stuff all comes later, depending on the pathway that students go into, okay? So I think your concern is very, very valid. I think it's a very good concern and we should be conscious of these kinds of things, but I don't think it's actually a problem because you, can, you don't need very much math to get to interesting things, okay? Now, before I go on, I noticed there was an earlier question from uh, Bimlesh Vadwa. Let me just take that quickly. Uh, how many years has it been with this curriculum? Um, so we've now, uh, well, so it depends on what you call this curriculum, right? So my, my approach to social studies started back in 2005. Uh, the middle school version of this actually launched earlier, about six years ago. At the university level, we've been doing this for about three and a half years at this point. Okay. So that hopefully that answers your question, uh, Ramesh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions uh, that you see over there um, in, in Q&A or anything else? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Sriram, there is uh, another question from Arjit Das. What can be the application of computer science education or CS1 outside teaching? Whether computer science education has any application in industry? I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question, but I think, uh, you know, there's the basic thing that industry needs computing education as well. I mean, in India, even more so than in uh, some other countries, right? I mean, we know this phenomenon where the big uh, sort of, uh, you know, the... TCLs and company end up like hiring all these people and uh, many of whom don't have much of a CS degree and have to train them over there. So certainly I think there's lots of training uh, opportunities there for training people for uh, uh, to prepare for industrial jobs. So I, maybe that's an answer, I think. But uh, maybe there's a, if there's a follow-up question to that, I'd love to take it. Um, and in the meanwhile, Bimlesh is asking, where does the visualization fit in here? Does that yeah. come in the beginning or uh, a little later? Great question, Bimlesh. Um, and you noticed that I sort of glossed over that during my talk. Uh, I think, you know, the way to think about a data-centric approach is not that it is a particular curriculum. We have a particular book, but it's not a particular curriculum, but rather a framework for curricula, right? You have to decide, a design a curriculum that is based on who you have and what their needs are. And also to some extent, what people are comfortable teaching. Right? So we have taken a particular path in our book. In fact, even in our book, it's a little funny because there's a funny fork in the book. The first three, four chapters are the same. And then uh, you know, there's some work that goes this way and some work that goes this way because there are different courses using our book. So even our book is not a single course, but really two courses that are prefix overlaid and then two suffixes. Right? So I think small amounts of visualization early make a lot of sense. I mean, you're gonna generate statistical things and you wanna get, you know, you, uh, like visualization is a somewhat easy way to get into statistics without the mathematics where you're just letting the human visual cortex do the work. But once you start getting into visualization, you have to also be very careful about the, the kinds of perils that come with visualization where people can, you know, the, for example, people start to see bimodality where there isn't bimodality, right? The data set is not actually bimodal, but they look at a picture and they think, oh, that looks like it's bimodal, right? I think it's actually very good to combine a computer science curriculum with um, things like, uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a famous book now called Calling Bullshit, which actually was used. Uh, several of the slides were used in uh, the previous presentation on data science uh, in this uh, in this um, uh, seminar series. Uh, you can find it. I I hope it's available online, and maybe there's a cheap version in India. Um, Eastern Economy Edition. It's called, it's called Calling Bullshit. There are lots of books like this, you know, Weapons of Math Destruction, et cetera. There are many, many books like this. And some of them do a quite nice job. There's actually much older books also, How to Lie with Charts and How to Lie with Statistics and so on, that basically show that there's people think they are better at statistical reasoning than they actually are, right? And this is also goes back to Kahneman and Tversky and people like that. Um, people are pretty bad at that. So I think there's a place for visualization. It's useful if you have, if you want to like get people to understand something about a data set and it's a quick and dirty way to do it. And also many people are familiar with it from having used something like, you know, Google Sheets or Excel, right? They've, they've been used to drawing uh, bar charts, pie charts and so on. Um, it's not a big part of our curriculum partly because I am conscious of the ways in which it can go wrong. Similarly with statistics, right? It's 
easy for us to fool ourselves with statistics. Uh, you know, Simpson's paradox, for example, right? It's very easy for people to make mistakes with statistics. And I don't want to teach them a little bit and have them go off and do crazy things and do bad things like p hacking and fall for Simpson's paradox and so on. So we don't do much of it in the first CS course, also because we have computer science we want to teach them, right? We want to do this data centric part early, motivate them get them to understand what computers can do for them. But then we also, it's a CS1 course in our case. So we have to get to things like trees and data structures and processing the data and so on. And you know, in, our, in my case, I'm a big believer in teaching things like software testing and writing examples early for problem comprehension and so on. Uh, and all of that also has to be fit in. So there's not much time for visualization and statistics. I would rather those be done in a course where there's enough time to do them properly rather than do a, a sort of crappy job. So we do only small amounts of it to get students sort of excited. And then we say like, you know, to do this well, you do it in a later class. But if you were teaching a more data, data science course than a data centric course, then you would have much more of maybe visualization and statistics, right? We're also conscious for the same reason. I think, uh, uh, I think it was Ulasso asked earlier, you know, what might you not turn students off? And we want to not turn students off. And that's why we go a little lighter early on. Okay? Thank you. So, Thank you, Sheeran. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, from Meenakshi Disausa from IIIT Bangalore. Uh, how will you compare <laughs> statistics as it is taught in high school with this data science? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, our goal, uh, my goal with Bootstrap Data Science is actually to change the way statistics is taught. In so I look I, how statistics is taught in high school is a huge topic, right? It's also there's you know how many million high schools in the world, and I can't tell you you know I, it's very hard to make universal statements. But by and large, statistics is still taught on paper. It has actually the same kind of problem that we have in intro CS. They produce these like tiny th tables, you know, that fit on a piece of paper. So it's like three rows or five rows of like made up people about, you know, uh, Ram and Sham and Joe and Blow and so on. Um, whereas we could be doing that with real data instead and actually ask meaningful questions. So bootstrap data science is my approach to reforming statistics education. And as I said, you go to bootstrapworld.org and all the materials are on there for free. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, over there. And we are basically using computational approaches. We make them do things on paper as well, but we also use computation because that's the only way you can actually do anything with the data set that has more than a five or six rows in it. And unless you do that, you're not gonna get to any real data. So I think there is a very valid, important critique of high school statistics. And this is our approach for dealing with that. And uh, one more question from Dr. K.S. Madhavan. Data can be more powerful than nuclear power. How do you ensure guardianship of data? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's a good question for a later course. Um, you know, I think this is where, uh, this is why it's a whole, it's becoming a whole discipline, right? It's becoming a discipline because there are so many things to deal with. How do you curate data? How do you keep data current? How do you, uh, you know, how do you guard the data? How do you prevent leakage of information? You know, uh, uh, you can you can talk about uh, uh, various forms of like extracting data and the ways you can learn things from that. And how do you, pre you know, differential privacy and so on. That's why it's a whole curriculum. And the question I think for us to think about is how much of that do our students need to know? And in my case, I feel, especially at the introductory level, I can't teach 90% of that. What I can do early on is I can teach students about the things that can go wrong, right? I want them to, instead of being like sort of this, this sort of cowboy mentality that so many programmers have, I want them to be like, uh, have some humility when they're dealing with data, right? So our goal, my goal is very much, we do a lot of readings as well in, our, in my intro class, right? This socially responsible computing curriculum where they see articles and you don't, you don't need big long articles, right? So like that, that, uh, that article about uh, falsehood programmers believe about names, you can read that in like 15 minutes, right? So I give them several articles. There's some uh, wonderful articles, for example, by Dana Boyd, who happens to be a Brown alum, but that's not why I use her materials uh, about some of these things that can go wrong. You know, she has a great article about YouTube and how YouTube, has made democracy worse. Um, and uh, so I make my students these so that I plant early in their heads the seed that this stuff is actually very potent and dangerous, right? It's a kind of nuclear, kind of toxic waste almost. Um, 
I tell them the solutions you're going to learn later on, and you can do this responsibly, but I want you to leave here not thinking, oh, I know how to compute a correlation, therefore I can go do anything, but instead be very sensitive to the fact that you can do harm through this process. And also in the case of data, do harm, to disproportionate harm to different uh, people. In the US, for example, you know, uh, black people and underrepresented people have been disproportionately harmed by data, and I want them to understand that. That's all I can hope to accomplish in an early course. And then from there, you know, there needs to be a rest of a curriculum that talk, tackles some of those questions. Thank you so much, uh, Sriram. I think uh, you have underscored a very important point, sensitizing the students uh, and, and uh, imparting them the humility to uh, deal with the data when they are uh, doing this sort of analysis. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, and uh, there is a question from Ullas. Uh, uh, how does this course eff uh, affects later yeah. core courses in CS? such as uh, operating systems. Does this change in the first course of CS? Uh, will this have an impact on the other courses which need to be addressed? Great question. Um, so, um, yeah, let me just, if I can quickly say something about the previous thing, I actually, uh, I'm happy. Uh, again, I put all of my course materials online as well. And if you're interested in some of these readings about socially responsible computing, uh, each of my course assignments has a, so, so like there's a programming part, maybe like a big O analysis sometimes, and then there's a socially responsible computing compu component. So you can look, for example, at my introductory course, which is 0190 at Brown. 0190. Um, and you can look at each assignment and most of them will have a socially responsible computing component with a link to some readings about that uh, and then some prompts that they have to answer. Uh, I also had a paper at ICER uh, uh, two years ago about, um, this was this is on this slide, uh, the one that says early post-secondary student performance on adversarial thinking. So that was in the intro class. We were specifically targeting the question of getting students to think about adversarial thinking. That also has links to various readings. So people who are interested in incorporating some of this, which I strongly encourage because it also makes the course feel a little more fun and interesting and lively. Um, you can find links to all of these things. And if you can't find them, if you tried and can't find them, reach out to me. But now I want to get back to Ulas's question, which is a great question. Um, it has some effect, but less than you think. Look, at the end of the day, you, you know, so partly we at, at Brown, we like to think of things not through courses, but through sequences. As I said, we're extremely, in, at, certainly in the US, we're extremely unusual in having um, four different introductory courses. Um, and in fact, at a research university in the US, it's almost unheard of to have four different introductory paths to the major. Um, but we don't think of them as courses, but rather two course sequences. So what they have to do is meet up after two courses, not after one course. If you give yourself two courses of space, you can actually do a lot of things, right? Even now, I bet if you looked at your CS1 and CS2, you can happily rearrange your CS1, CS2 in this, this style, losing almost nothing, gaining some things. And at the end of the day, after CS2, you will notice almost no change, no impact, right? Yeah, there may be some small things that you didn't mention. You might think just because you covered it, your students learned it or remember it, they don't learn it, they don't remember it. So it doesn't actually matter that much. Um, at Brown, we have not had any impact at all, but that's because we have a shared interface that all of these sequences have to meet. And all we do is meet that shared interface and everything's good from there, right? So, so it's a great question, very thing, important thing to be sensitive to, but I think not that big a problem. Thank you, Sriram, uh, for clarifying that. Uh, now I have some uh, questions uh, on my own. Uh, uh, that is, uh, when you, you said that you have not touched upon the programming languages uh, in this talk, uh, uh, but still, if you have to uh, make the whole curriculum data centric, uh, then probably Python would fit in uh, better there compared to uh, uh, co compared to C or C plus plus. I don't know whether you will agree that or not. But uh, when uh, when dealing with uh, languages, uh, there are strong emotions among faculty members. Even a uh, change from uh, C to Python for an introductory programming course, it was, there was a lot of debate and people were like, uh, how can this change after a couple of decades, uh, this, uh, this will have a serious impact on downstream courses. Uh, so much of debate in the BOS uh, I have uh, faced myself. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so the thing is, uh, whether you like it or not, the language will also come into picture somewhere. If you want to make it as a data-centric curriculum, I would think. 
for example, now we have made our first semester uh, common uh, programming course as a Python course. And uh, immediately in the second semester, we have an introduction to data science where we make use of Python and do all these uh, kind of uh, data set analysis and everything. Is there anything wrong in that approach? Well, I'm not going to tell anybody that what they're doing is wrong because it's the easiest way to make enemies and you don't actually convince anybody of anything that way anyway. Um, I actually think Python as an introductory language is not bad. Uh, I think it's actually more problematic than most people realize. Programming with state early is very difficult. And usually when people tell me, oh, it's easy, it means they're not actually dealing with any of the hard parts. So uh, in our course, and in fact, in our own book, uh, we start with a language called Pirate, which, uh, as I mentioned, we've been designing, which is basically meant to be like Python without any of the weird and hard parts. And then after about two thirds of the way through, we switch to Python and we teach them how to program responsibly with state. OK, uh, and so, you know, after that, we go into all sorts of other topics like you were mentioning, uh, but we start in Pirate and then switch to Python. And that happens to be something that uh, meets all of the pedagogic goals that we have. We want them to learn things in a way that has fewest obstacles and Python does actually create some obstacles. Now, I wanna be really clear. Somebody listening to this is gonna be like, ha, sure, I'm told me Python is problematic. Therefore, we should go back to C. No, that is completely, totally not what I am saying. Don't even begin to misrepresent me that way. Um, that is not what I'm saying at all. I think it's, I cannot believe that people are actually teaching C to introductory students in 2022, but hey, you know, if that's what floats your boat, that's what floats your boat. Uh, I, I think, look, at the end of the day, we're all really good at doom and gloom, and we have a strongly, as you had said, strongly held position. Um, we have almost no evidence for any of these positions, right? These are emotional arguments, even as simple a matter as syntax is a deeply emotional argument. And we can't just say, oh, I feel emotional about this because then we're like, oh, that's not a very rational thing to say. So what we claim is, well, if you do this, terrible things will happen downstream, okay? I think we should stop doing that. And I think we should instead do research on it. We are all com trained computer scientists. You know, if I came to you and said, hey, I have this new compiler and it's an amazing compiler. And if you'd use any other compiler, terrible things will happen to you. You'd be like, why? It's like, well, because I say so, right? And you'd laugh at me, right? You'd say, where's your evidence? What data do you have? It's qualitative data, quantitative data. What can you do to convince me? We don't approach curricula that way, right? Curricula are like a battleground where it's all driven by emotion, but nobody wants to admit that. So we, you know, we pretend that it's not emotional, that it's some rational thing. And of course, it's always a little bit like, you know, a little bit like astrology or something, right? Like we don't tell you anything that's going to happen in five minutes. We tell you like five years from now, terrible things will happen. Those are not even testable hypotheses, right? So I think we should. So this is why I said we really need to be thinking about curricula as research spaces. Every course is actually a research project, right? There's a hypothesis. If I do things this way, the following thing will happen, but we don't treat our courses that way. And we should be treating our courses that way. So when I tell you Python is problematic, I'm not just making up this idea. We have done lots of research on this. We've studied this, we've studied state. And in fact, if you go to the PL community, we've been studying the effects of state for decades. Uh, I can show you papers where we talked about the difficulties of starting out with state, right? So I can tell you that, you can decide you know, what typically happens in education is the things that are supportive of somebody's position we take, the things that are not supportive, we're like, ah, no, I'm sure there must be some problem with your sampling, it must be your population, whatnot, because at the end of the day, we're still not that rational when it comes to education. So I can't change anybody's mind. All I can tell you is we've done the research, we have papers, you can read them, you can agree with them, not agree with them. And that's anybody's choice. But if you're still fighting like Python versus C battles, I'm sorry, that's just like, you're still in the wrong century. That's all I can say. It's, there's no good reason to subject students to see as the first language in 2021 or 2022. It's actually, I would claim, actively harmful. Okay, I'm going to make a strong statement here. It's actively harmful. Unless you're teaching students all the problems that come with C. Look, it's just like you teach students statistics and you don't tell them the problems with statistics. That is irresponsible as an educational person. The same way, if you're going to teach people C and you're not going to teach them about all of the problems that come with C, if you're not going to teach them about all the vulnerabilities that it causes, and we're still spending billions of dollars or rupees or whatever currency you want every year because of that, that's just irresponsible. And you're not, you're not, you're being an unethical educator. How's that for a provocative statement? 
So you can take that comment back to your colleagues and now they'll hate me even more. <laughs> Thank you, Sriram. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but I do actually quite believe that. I think it's true. I, we have to confront that, right? We're teaching people harmful things, dangerous weapons, and we're not willing to teach them how the weapons are dangerous. You know, uh, Dr. Madhavan talked about, you know, data is like nuclear, is like a nuclear waste, a nuclear product, right? Well, would we teach, would you have a nuclear science course that never said anything about, it's like, oh, look, nuclear is great. You get free power. It's so awesome. And never talked about disposal, that would be utterly irresponsible, would be totally unethical. Teaching C without teaching these things is exactly the same thing. And teaching Python without explaining the problems with state is almost the same sort of thing. It's just not half as bad as teaching C early. So. Okay, yeah, th thanks a lot. Uh, I guess there are uh, no more questions. Uh, very uh, good. Th yeah, thank you so much uh, for that uh, very uh, insightful and at the same time very provocative and controversial talk. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, it, it definitely uh, makes every faculty member to uh, introspect. Uh, there are, uh, that is at least, uh, I know that uh, the faculty members are teaching the uh, vulnerabilities that are part of C also, but then transitioning from C to Python as a, a first level programming language, it, it took a lot of, uh, uh, this thing, a lot of inertia was there. And again, as that student Ullas was asking, people normally used to say that uh, uh, when you are uh, writing OS code or uh, networking code, understanding C code is important. Uh, so how can you remove uh, uh, C programming? So this often has uh, come, as, uh, come in discussions. Uh, anyway. But look, uh, I mean, by that same argument, Nobody, you know, if you, if you take C programming out, how will you ever write an operating system? Well, first of all, I can tell you that, by the way, Brown has been, uh, uh, back when Solaris was still a thing, half the Solaris kernel development team came from one course, from the operating systems course at Brown, okay? So yeah. Brown has created more OS programmers than I think most places. We have never taught C at the introductory level. We have always thought it immoral to teach C at the introductory level. Okay, even if we disagree on what to do, the one thing we can agree on is it's immoral to teach C and C++ to rank beginners. And yet we've managed to create like some of the world's top operating systems. So that's a bogus argument, okay? Also, if why is the OS course so important? I mean, how many people write an operating system? Almost nobody writes an operating system. There's five of them and we just go download one, right? What about the data science class? If the argument is if you don't do X from day one, how will you do this later on? Well, then if you don't do Python from day one, how are you gonna do data science later on? If you don't do like, you know, ML from day one, how are you gonna write a compiler later on? If you don't do, and there's so many more things, more, so many more people doing all these other things other than writing operating systems that that doesn't even make sense, right? Nobody writes a compiler in C. Nobody writes like data science code in C. Nobody does any of these things in C. So like that, that argument doesn't, isn't even logically consistent. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that, More thank provocation. You. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sriram. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very valid argument. And uh, uh, it's a very, very uh, insightful talk, uh, which needs to be reflected and introspected by uh, every faculty member and uh, the curriculum designer so that uh, we can uh, redesign the introductory computing course at uh, our uh, college levels and if, if it is if it makes sense even at the school level some i know that some of the uh, school level uh, uh, teachers are also probably attending this uh, webinar uh, so uh, uh, at least there can be healthy discussions uh, and uh, uh, some something good uh, can come out of that uh, whole discussion uh, so Great. thanks to all of you for attending the webinar uh, on a Saturday evening. If your yes. question could not be taken up, uh, I think I retook all the questions. Uh, so if, if you have questions later on, feel free to uh, send an email to uh, Sriram. So probably if he uh, gets time, he'll be happy to answer that. And you can access this presentation and recording uh, later on, maybe after a couple of days. Uh, uh, please look forward to an announcement of uh, our next webinar uh, after a uh, month or so. Until then, goodbye. Thank you so much, uh, Sriram, for your time you, and a very interesting really talk. It. Thank you Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah.